Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody's flight was uh, enjoyable. Um, so we'll kick off today. Uh, building a virtualization client for free BSD, BLive, and OpenZMS. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm the ICT security lead for community, uh, for Trove Community Health Service. Uh, we're a uh, uh, not government organisation, not for profit um, health services uh, service in Gippsland, uh, Australia. So it's in Victoria, it's right around the corner. Um, we were just a small organisation with uh, about 400 staff and um, uh, eight offices um, around a small part of Gippsland. Uh, but uh, we have grown. So I'm just going to go through a brief introduction about us and myself, um, and then I'm going to get the background of how this came about, um, the problem that we were challenged with, move into a conceptual stage of how we built the appliance, uh, moving to production, and then as all products of the, the reiteration and ongoing maintenance. So about me. Um, I've been in the IT field for 26 years, came out of high school, um, self-taught. Uh, so basically I landed in the era of pre-Windows 95, where back to rule, out of rule, um, and uh, we were a, well I started off with people support, but then I eventually found my, my uh, calling in, in Unix, and then once I started getting into some uh, Solaris and Linux, and then I got introduced to OpenBSD in 2000 when I was uh, working out of Hong Kong um, on a B2B, B2B project there. Um, Canadian colleague came up and said, let's try this. Um, he's up there with the <laughs> um, And um, I thought, wow, this is good. This is just, you know, lightweight where Linux was getting fatter and fatter. You know, there was no system to Linux at that time. It was getting fatter and fatter, but um, OpenBSD was a big one that we could do. Um, um, and now I'm an advocate for BSDs, so um, every BSD is different, which is good. It should not be just a single BSD where you, uh, a single point where like it, it has a path to SSL. SSL was a, uh, open SSL, SSL was a disaster, and um, now we've seen falls with that. So BSDs have that, and that's why I'm an advocate for trying. You know, if open BSD does a good job, firewall rally, we'll use that. If it can be a storage appliance, Right tool for the right job. Um, and then, yes, I do have a life outside of computers. Um, uh, I was previously into road racing, but I do a lot of endurance travel riding because um, I'm getting older and uh, it's now about being smart rather than being fast. Um, so, about us, um, we were originally a Gippsland based NFT NGO um, with eight offices, as I said, um, but now we've grown to 900 plus users. Um, across the state of Victoria. So we have now 51 sites across Victoria, so it's not the case, 51, um, which covers a land mass of 230 square kilometers, uh, 230,000 square kilometers, which is the size of Laos in Asia. So you make that up in the US. So it gives you an idea of how big our footprint is um, from a maintenance perspective. So and all those updates, it's like you've got to make sure that they work right or it's a bit of a drive. That's how Um, and um, our values uh, or our mission statement for the organisation is better health, better lifestyles, and strong communities throughout the, the appliance. Um, background in the first half of 2016, we won a contract uh, with uh, the Australian government. It was a um, it came about in the in the 2000s, and then it progressed, and it was to provide the national uh, national disability insurance scheme. So it's a um, sort of like the NHS um, or the Canadian health system, but it's for disabilities. So it's it's to provide um, uh, programs and funding for for participants um, to be able to meet their needs and goals in the community. Um, so in mid 2016 um, was our first rollout of uh, uh, sites. So 
first of all, we had two, two, two small sites. Well, one was a bigger site. It was about 60 people that were going to be working out of that site, and the other one had about five people. Um, so we had to deploy some infrastructure. We didn't know what was what was ahead. We had no idea of how big this was this was going to grow, or where we would end up where we are today. However, it sort of gave us the ability to try things to see what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, so we hooked up with a, a 10, 10 megabit um, MPLS connection. Not big, but you know, internet Australia is expensive. Um, which gave us uh, connectivity back into our um, uh, like hub and spoke topology of our, net, our core network. Uh, also saw uh, the rollout of obviously switching, so we use a layer three switch gear, and an ESXi host running Windows Server 2016 for for um, printing services. That just gave us the ability to um, you know put something else on there if we needed to, or spin up another Windows server or something like that. We were not uh, too concerned um, at the time to be going down the virtualization path that wasn't even on the radar at that particular point in time. Um, so as the staff numbers grew, we we sort of hit a bit of a roadblock because the tablets that we got given by the government to do work on their portal, so each tablet has a VPN client that connects back to the Australian government's VPN gateway, um, it started generating a lot of traffic. Took out our Windows updates and sort of stuff over that, and the ten gen connection back into our core network and then our, our SBSD firewall um, wasn't big enough for this. So I had to come up with an idea of how to deliver uh, more capacity without increasing cost, because as I said, that MPLS ten ten connection that costs us in the region of fifteen hundred dollars. Australian, which is about, I suppose, twelve hundred US dollars um, a month. So it wasn't cheap. So the idea was, we sat down. I sat down with my manager while we were at the site. Well, it was actually dinner time. We sat there and um, had a couple of beers. And I thought, how about if we take that VLAN that all those are on and offload it straight out to the internet? So I came up with a concept. We ordered a cheap internet connection. Um, the National Broadband Network was being rolled out in Australia at the time, um, and this was at Ballarat, which was a fibre-to-the-premises um, uh, site. So we had access to 140, and we could buy that at about 150 Australian dollars, so a tenth of the cost, but 10 times the capacity. So um, basically, um, a Guest, an OpenBSD guest was added to the SXI host, um, set up the appropriate networking and that sort of stuff, and then I was able to drop that out to an internet connection that was dirt cheap. So it was basically you know, just pass out that specific traffic, which was 443, to a specific IP address, which is the government gateway, and problem solved. Um, no capacity constraints, we could monitor it and that sort of stuff. And it gave us a good indication of when you've got this many people on site, how much bandwidth we, we're going to need. Because nobody could give us any figures at that point in time what we needed. So we were sort of flying blind what we needed. Um, so that generates the problem. So we had to take stock from those lessons learned as I sort of detailed um, there before you. Uh, we needed to uh, come up with a reproducible device, um, something that was we could maintain and then we could roll out multiple of that had a reasonable licensing model, which ESXi clearly didn't. Um, it was it was costly. Uh, I mean, obviously we get a, a reasonable rate from uh, VMware in regards to that, but it was not it wasn't okay with me because um, the product that we had was really limited in what we could do. So just think of the development. Um, so we needed our devices also to be durable and one of the other sites in this region which is called the Central Highlands region which is uh, out Ballarat way so between Bendigo and well, Bendigo is for the Australian viewers is the Bendigo was the boundary up there and then there was um, uh, Geelong which is south so Ballarat sits in the middle um, one of the 
bit further out west, the premises that we had there, uh, the rack was in a broom closet with um, you know, cleaning products and mops and stuff like that. And there was no ventilation, there was no window, there was nothing. So it was basically just this hot room of dust and smells. So we had to make sure that uh, uh, any sort of device that we were going to roll was going to be able to operate in hard conditions. Uh, I had a limited budget to work with, so uh, that meant that you know where I could save money um, on the software costs meant that you know we could spend a little bit more on more reliable hardware. Um, and the key here was phase two of the NDIS rollouts. So you know, in total, we've had three phases of the NDIS. Really? No. Yeah, three phases of the NDIS rollout. Um, so it was already under negotiation, so I had to come up with a solution quickly because the next one was going to be huge. So the concept. So we started off with um, Beehive uh, just because um, I already had it in testing and it was working extremely well. Uh, OpenBSD worked on it with Grubbs Beehive and um, Windows 2016 basically the UEFI support came on online at the right time, so uh, that that hit the mark. We were, we were off to the races. Basically, we had we had a hypervisor ready to go. Um, Beehive from FreeBSD was also chosen because of the uh, liberal liberal light BSD license. We you know we could do what we wanted. We could make the we can make the appliance customize the appliance, do what we needed to do, and then you know. It also helped by anything that we've, we've found, and even to this day, we, we find find things, and you know, it gets reported back to the projects, and then uh, you know, patches get made. So, you know, uh, while BSD means that we can take it and then just leave it totally in house, um, nobody progresses from there. Uh, but at least we had the option, whereas, you know, if you go down the GPL path, you're stuck, you've got to go get that. Um, another key component. Why FreeBSD was chosen was ZFS. Um, I come from a time where Veritas Volume Manager was the uh, king of the fleet, and uh, you know he rolled out every Sun server that he worked on for a client. Was basically had Veritas Volume Manager licenses attached to it, and then you would roll that out. That gave you an ultra reliable file system and Volume Manager. Volume Manager is key there. Um, it means you have better control over your guest disks, and you also have other other key components like snapshotting, which is um, uh, crucial for running a, a uh, hypervisor uh, where you want to update guests at any point in time. So OpenZFS uh, rules the fleet there. The other thing was FreeBSD was simplistic. So it was not only just being lightweight, which made us be able to create a type two, well, in my, in my mind, was creating a type one hypervisor because all it did was be a hypervisor. Um, the fact that there's no system D or any of the other kludge that seems to be building up in some of these other operating systems now um, was not going to play a part. So we knew that the, the, the key component, the hypervisor, was going to be ultra reliable and had a small footprint. Uh, the device that we're looking at, we were looking at uh, from a storage perspective what's going to last for five years because these things are going to get racked and left for five years base they are going to get maintained remotely via software but the actual hardware was going to be um, uh, left in place so we chose ssd and you know that in itself for enterprise ssd is not cheap so um, you know we had to get err on the side of smaller so that then led us to the hardware discovery phase where I went out to market to see what the market had. Basically, Lenovo had nothing. IAC system had something. Um, and Supermicro had something. Basically, the same same unit. Um, the only problem we had there was management weren't, weren't too keen to deal with someone that wasn't present in Australia, especially from a support perspective. So, um, whereas Supermicro does have distribution. Australia, so we ended up um, going with the Supermicro product, um, and we really had no issues with that. So, 
that's what it ended up. So yeah, we get brocade switches out to each site. So it's just the standard layer two switch. VLANs with about five VLANs, I think, from the top, from the top of my head. Um, and that's basically the front, just the five VLAN, VLANs going over into the post, and then the other component there goes out to the roof and is loaded and deployed to our private premises as well. So you need for a BDSL mode or ADS, even just ADSL mode, some places have got ADSL, which the uplink is really sucks. So, sorry, Chris. <laughs> um, and if anything, actually, you do need to just yell out and say what you mean by this. Or you can talk to the guys down there. Um, we'll have two ADSL ports set up, so then that way we can actually use our domains in OpenBSD and then drop out certain VLANs to different um, uh, connections. So, the Super Micro Server was a uh, 5019A. FTN4, which is an atom based server, so it has eight cores, no, yeah, eight cores, one thread per core. Um, not obvious, over, overly fast, so we, you know, we weren't too concerned about speed, even running a Windows server um, guest, because all it was doing is print services anyway. So once it was fired up, it was fine. Uh, but the fans in it, there was not really much of a cooling issue, so the fans we could assume would get clogged up and stop working, and we knew that the actual unit would keep going. Uh, what it provided was four one gig Ethernet ports. Uh, you know, we needed a minimum of two on the spec. Um, however, we're glad we went with four, so we'll always go further on the side of caution because those sites that we couldn't get um, BDSL or fiber, we ended up able to use two ADSL ports and all the two services into that. Um, and the device was low powered, so it meant that we didn't have to have chunky UPSs to run these devices. Storage was two 240 gig and Intel Enterprise SSDs um, using uh, OpenZFS in a mirrored configuration. Uh, that meant that you know we could burn one out, wear one out, the other one would be in place, rinse and repeat, scrub, resilver, ready to rock and roll again. Um, and we used OpenZFS uh, for those drives. So basically there's only the two drives in the mirror configuration. There's no extended drives, there's no external storage or anything like that. It's all just one self-contained unit. Yeah, the first iteration saw FreeBSD 11.0. Um, there was a few issues that we had, I'll go into them shortly, but um, the FreeBSD was selected because it's easy to maintain or report bugs. I had several contacts through Michael to um, to throw things through. Uh, then I got to meet Peter Green, and um, uh, then basically, you know, two Aussies talking about footy and drinking beer, and uh, was able to sort of you know continue that you know issue where I'd flag an issue or you know a certain thing that was that was griping me because we had to build these devices so end users like our admin team could maintain those. We didn't want to have something that was only able to be maintained by one particular person. Uh, going down that path, I've been there before, it just, you know, you end up, you know, having to deal with, um, you know, support stuff when you want to be having a break and on holiday, so I want to be able to come away to conferences and not have to have people ring me. Um, patch support, so we didn't actually go for a custom build of FreeBSD, generic kernel generic everything, that meant that we could then utilize the, the FreeBSD frameworks for uh, patching and upgrades uh, very simply and using the resources that the project provides. Um, we used UFI support, so OpenBSD was booted through Grub2 Beehive and uh, Windows Server 2016 boots perfectly, the ISO and the operating system boot perfectly using the UFI framework. And FreeBSD 11 was selected because of its long-term support. So I can't emphasize this enough. It's businesses look for long-term support when it comes to software because a lot of this stuff gets deployed and we just want to be able to patch in place. We've got other projects that need to be looked at and that sort of stuff. Once we've developed the product and rolled it out in the field, we want to do minimal um, uh, R&D 
to uplift to a, a new major version. And the guest management on the concept was Chives, which was a fork of IO Hive. Did I get it right? Yeah, IO Hive. Um, IO, IO Hive was, was good, but it needed a fair bit of work and it was, it was stalled. Chives was a fork of that and um, they'd done a fair bit of work. However, I did find a bit of kludge, which um, I'll talk about in problems in the concept. So the guests saw OpenBSD 6.1. It was a really good release. Um, it was the one prior to Carl. Uh, Carl did cause a few issues for us down the track, uh, but we did sort, well, it has been, so Anton sort, sorted that out with uh, improving the scripts. Uh, so, <laughs> what was that? In, with Carl. Um, when you're booting an Atom server, they boot very slow. And when you're doing relinking, relinking would be happening in the background, syspatch would blat it, or the user could reboot it, and then all of a sudden the relink hasn't completed, the kernel isn't done, then all of a sudden you've bricked your guest. And when... Yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it was a bit... I, I did submit a patch um, uh, to the man page for, I think it was SoftDev. Um, but SoftDev wasn't the cause, SoftDev was just a thing that when I disabled SoftDev, it seemed to alleviate the particular problem or it became more evident and it didn't actually black stuff too much. Um, but Theo said I was going down the wrong path, which is fine because I wasn't, I didn't know what I was looking at. I was basically just trying to solve a problem once, once Carl got ro rolled because, uh, yeah, that was a 10 hour drive. <laughs> um, so yeah, 6.1 using Grub, Grub Beehive and uh, Server 2016 using UEFI. So the networking component. So how we configured networking here, as I, as I talked about, um, all of networking was done and VLANing was done in the host operating system at the pre-BSD level. Um, guests should always be past adapters and not have to be, con not have to concern be concerned about VLAN because um, you don't want guests there sniffing traffic that they shouldn't be at. They shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to look at. So by putting uh, tap interfaces into the guest as uh, third IO uh, interfaces means that they get that interface to be when they're allowed to have other things. Um, so the main port was the IGB zero. That was the trunking port uh, where all the VLANs were trunked on. And the secondary port um, or tertiary port, you know, ports uh, IGB 1 and 2 um, were bridged. So they weren't VLAN off or anything like that. They were just bridged directly to an adapter that was then presented to the guest, which was OpenBSD. Uh, that allowed any um, ISP related stuff. So uh, some of our connections use DHCP to the ISP, others use uh, PPPoE. So um, by having that bridge meant that the OpenBSD guest could do the authentication or DHCP request uh, to get its IP to continue its connection. Um, OpenZFS, so each guest had its own Z vol for storage. Uh, that allowed for snapshots prior to upgrade, which was great. Um, nothing like being able to go snap OpenBSD, BSDRD, and then does it all work? Yes. Does it not work? That's fine. Just roll back and um, and then work out what went wrong. Uh, basically, we had a lab set up with the same infrastructure, so we haven't had to roll back like that. Um, our tests uh, have always been successful, but you know, it is always the case that something might not work, and at least we've got that uh, uh, feature. However, our lab equipment always keeps a Windows Server 2016 image up to date. So we just keep that rolling, keep the updates happening, doing a ZFS snapshot, sending it to the uh, mirror server internally, and then that way we can just pull that straight image straight down when we go do it in the build and we don't have to sit there waiting for an Atom server to do um, Windows updates. Windows updates are slow on an Atom server, at like a day for a major. Um, and then the uh, ports packages that were installed no modification to any of these. They were basically all just dropped on there, except for chives. So chives, we had to hack three files 
um, to be able to say use uh, version numbering. So if you look at this sequence by Kevin Bears getting installed, uh, he has this um, reference to the directory number called BSDRV uh, to change it to a version. And that was hard to plug in with Jive, so I had to do a hack um, in the library files to get it to do what it needed to get it to use. So that brings us to a standard configuration in rc.conf in FreeBSD. Um, what's there is basically what we use. Um, there is other components that uh, I've left out because they're standard when you do a FreeBSD install, so there's no point in explaining them. Uh, but this is how we basically configured up VLANs on the particular host um, that then were able to be used as bridges um, into the adapters that represented to the guests. So, oh, <laughs> cool. Um, guest installation. So OpenBSD was installed individually, not from the master image. That way we could then have uh, IV2 keys all um, individualized and SSH keys. Um, and if you've ever done an OpenBSD install, it's like all of 30 seconds. That's it if, if you're um, slow. Um, the Windows Server 2016 was uh, installed from a maintained image, so uh, an image that we cut that hadn't been activated. Uh, all we do is just keep it updated, and then once we've installed it, then we activate based on the um, UUID that's on the actual um, uh, virtualization um, startup config file. So, yeah, this is how we, we just pump it straight from our mirror server straight to a uh, Z bulb, ready to rock and roll. Um, so we got the installation down to four minutes. Slowest bits actually the network <laughs> moving the image. So um, uh, even ZFS on atom based servers is fast. So that's sort of something to take into consideration. So these are the problems as I was sort of um, mentioning previously. Um, Chives um, couldn't handle group priority when you use trump p two different bootloaders. So using UEFI and grub2, um, yeah, priority just goes out the door, doesn't work. And I found this out um, 1159 before BSD can in 2017 and went to Melissa and I've got to fly out tomorrow. <laughs> um, but, you know, I took stock at an hour because I had to get six devices out the door before I left. And um, basically, you got at 30 back RC local ring up, which yeah, it would be really convenient if I sleep, sleeps from the blends. Yeah, 30, I leave cheap, cheap what it needs to do, and those devices are out there for six months before I want to come back there. Um, the hacking of the library scripts, as I was talking about, uh, it was a bit of a pain, but there was nothing I could really do. Um, and I wasn't prepared to sort of invest too much time in Chives because I knew that that was not going to be sustainable long term. So um, we just left it as that. Um, and also Chives used a, a really complex uh, set of uh, file locations for where the um, images for the host were stored, even the configuration files had their own um, data set, which was like, you know, like, well, I have a data set for a couple of kilobytes of files. I really couldn't sort of fathom that. And when you do the ZFS list, it's just damn ugly. So, yeah, that was that was a bit of a showstopper for us too. Um, the boot methods. So having two boot methods for starting guests was overly complex. We decided uh, you know, that's not sustainable either. Uh, and grub to beehive was was not something that our team was used to support. So uh, they'd have to learn command line interfaces and understand consoles and serial consoles in Unix. And I wasn't prepared to go down that path of teaching them that or, write, or writing the applicable documentation. So um, UEFI is what we needed to do, or CBIOS if that was ever going to be available. So um, we 
which is still not available, but UEFI seems to be working well for it for its, with um, OpenBSD, um, having GPT and UEFI support native now. Um, so that's, we're, we're fine. Um, we've got our needs met. Um, and the UEFI bootloader um, in ports at the time bought in so much stuff that we didn't need on the hypervisor. So we bought in GCC, all sorts of ugly stuff that yeah really shouldn't have been part of the um, the uh, bootloader package. But that's all been fixed now. So um, enjoy the bootloaders. I've done a patch which I'll talk about later um, uh, for UEFI, which fixes um, OpenBSD. Um, so, FreeBSD, we did have problems there. Um, so 11.0 uh, threw a few issues in with the network stack. So we actually had to turn off TX, TXM, uh, TSO6, TSO4, LRO, which was a bit of a pain because that really hurt the performance for the guests. Not that you know our links were big enough to really worry about it, but you know that meant more load on the actual kernel and then into the hypervisor, um, you know, impacting hypervisor performance where it could have been offloaded to the networks, um, the network card itself. And uh, initially we had to um, lock down cores and threads. So then that way if we ran other operating systems like say Windows 10, um, that has a licensing issue if you um, have uh, more like present two C two physical CPUs to it. Um, so by striking it down and saying, okay, I want four um, vCPUs, you're not going to, you know, Windows 10 is going to then have you know, basically four threads rather than um, trying to be presented four physical CPUs. So then we move to production. So these problems were not a showstopper. We go, okay, We've got a few problems, but we've got around them. We've got, you know, we've, we've sorted out the network stack in FreeBSD. We've got the bootloaders sorted. We did the appropriate hacks we needed to. Right, we're good, we're good. So um, went to the boss and said, yep, yeah, you know, we've got 90% uh, usability, so the team can sort of manage this, but we've got 100% uh, functionality. We've got what we had with ESXi. We're ready to move forward. So, uh, management were committed, they go, great, that's good, we've got a product, let's go. So um, the project got named point five, and there's been successive um, point series since then. We've got a now a point three, which is just a small little device that's plugged into the main switch, which is like the LED stuff. And um, you know, you can use it just as a logo for a site that's got two or three people. Does exactly what Vicky Unit does, um, but on a smaller scale. So we had the management commitment, we went ahead and uh, purchased inventory for the 1.0 rollout, and we decided to come back and reassess um, our tooling uh, uh, as things improved within the community and, and more, more things happened around um, uh, Chives, if Chives was going to be uh, what we decided to continue on. At that time, we had no idea, but you know. As with any product, you should reiterate and renew. So, version one saw a pallet of 25 units turn up uh, for the 5019 FTN4 from Sigma Micro. Um, ran for FreeBSD 11, and basically everything that came out of the concept uh, got rolled in. So the appliance was uh, appliances were spun up and shipped for install. So we um, initially had, because we had to go fast, we had outsourced contracting would just go in and actually plug these things into the rack and then set them up for us. We had a install guide that they'd follow. As long as they plugged the ports in the right places, the devices would come up. I'd see them back at the head office. I could just complete the install and then away we go. Um, so we had no issues on the initial deployment. Everything that went out in the field worked. Um, FreeBSD update, fetch, and install around the Beehive guests was um, not problematic at all. It basically worked. We could then, you know, um, the OpenBSD guest was the last thing that was 
stay up because some of these guests were sent um, uh, as being a rally. So that was the interface. You didn't actually have access to see that you had to come in through the guests in that bus box. So um, it was it was good to see the previously update updated everything to the blue live and everything around it. And then once we were good to go, um, shut down as uh, emergency units and go and go into our PTSD. Our guests stuff they can now is going to wait four minutes and bang, it's all back up and running again. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's easy to maintain, that's why we're still on the 11 3 now. Um, even the, VM, the initial VMware ESXi host that was used for the proof of concept of how we wanted to sort of take this to clients, um, we swapped that out because I well, had one thing in this field that took everything else we wanted to do as one. So the SSI gone, the Live native, that was it. Um, so this is a example of what we put in the documentation for our, our contractors. Um, so they could um, cable up correctly, but it gives you an indication of how we actually configured things. So um, the printers were on a different VLAN, um, video conferencing was on a different VLAN, the wild access points had multiple VLANs as you with Cisco access points. Um, then they were all crunked into there, which the OWFD guest had you know, multiple interfaces and managed all the traffic that went to and from um, the VLAN and controlled it. Uh, we don't have any performance issues with that. However, um, in uh, high performance um, tests, we are seeing some um, issues with performance of the Vert IO net um, driver in, in OpenBSD. So hopefully more work in the lock area of OpenBSD and network stack will improve that performance. But when you compare, um, say, three BSD guests, the Dragon, five BSD guests, open BSD guests, the, the Vert IO net stuff um, is, is low in the performance area in the same virtual point of view. So, you know, we'll get 700 megabits a second out of uh, Dragonfly as a guest. We'll get about six on FreeBSD and about three more on OpenBSD. However, that's sufficient for our, our production guide. You needed to see, you know, where our CDN switch is got to be able to scan further than how much, how long have we got before we start pushing the CDN. Um, so then you see the green line moves out to the ISP. So that device there is any generic device that might be what our ISP needs to, to connect. Uh, that can be you know, a five premises NTD or a VDSL modem, ADSL modem. And then uh, the, all the traffic to VLAN. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Totally agree. Um, yeah, as I said, we we haven't got there yet, but at least you know we're already looking down the path of the future and what we need to sort of take into consideration when we have to go from a performance point of view. I'm so happy with this device that you know we're even looking at swapping our firewalls out with this. So um, it, it is that. That good. Uh, our firewalls is still, you know, we've, our main firewall is only 100 100 connection. Um, so we're not going to hit the limits there by using that device in place as well. At the moment, it's bare metal hardware running OpenBSD. Um, but it, from, a, from a, a maintenance point of view, I, want, I love the snapshots. I love the features of snapshots because then it makes an easy rollback. Um, so then moves us on to reiteration. So, you know, faster hardware uh, required where environmental conditions allowed. So the Atom servers, um, you know, we had a few complaints from a couple in the admin team that 
that uh, maintaining the Windows Server or doing stuff on the Windows Server was slow. I could understand that, but I then also argued back and said, how often are you logged into there to do the work? Yeah, not often. I go, well, you know. Um, so, you know, we did look, look um, for something else. Um, and then we also wanted to get rid of multiple bootloaders. We wanted to go all the way across, all in. Um, that also meant that we could then look at a more simplistic management for administrators. So we have some administrators that are versed in um, manage, managing the VM and changing the configuration of the VM, and then we have other administrators that can then deal with the um, ZFS file system so they can increase volumes as they need fit, the see fit. So when we rolled these out, they were just basically 30 gig images, but with Windows Server and patching, it's blown out. So, you know, they'll just move, to, move between all the servers and increase the volumes to 50 gig and next, then reboot the server, snap out the, um, the NTFS file system, and they're away off the races with um, 50 gig volumes. Um, there's also addressing the VNC console issues with um, Beehive Unify and OpenBSD. So, um, with managing a normal UEFI environment brought into play and graphics stack um, for, for administrators. So, basically, all our administrators could then use uh, simple tools like Beehive uh, VNC or VNC, whatever, whatever your flavor to um, manage the host so they could see it come up from, from boot and then you know, uh, have access to all the forwards that they pick up from the VM and it's it's easy they can do that through the graphics interface. Um, OpenBSD would um, when it you go from the bootloader and then turn it to the kernel, the kernel phase would then go, what's the maximum resolution that this UEFI has? And that would blow up the screen. Well, what's it saying down here? It's like the administering servers and just like small console and squeeze it like that. Um, I'll get to how we fix that uh, shortly. But, um, and then continue using the other tools that we worked with, um, that we had, uh, continue using those because they were, they worked for us. So, um, we use ZX for and uh, Z Snap 2, which was perfect for um, maintaining snapshots, rolling snapshots back, or transferring snapshots from a back to a backup perspective. Uh, because basically, we take all the images from all the guests and they just go back to a central mirror server. So if we need to redeploy, we can just take those recent images back out. Maybe those, you know, our OpenBSD versions will just they were when they snap, and same with our Windows versions. So version two, Saurus uh, adopt the uh, Super Micro uh, 5019 SML, which is a Xeon based server. Um, still, still the same amount of RAM. Oh, RAM was 16 gigs. So that's all we use for these clients. We don't see, because they're only running basically to guests, um, there was no need to have any more than that. Windows Server 2016 actually runs all right for gig of RAM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and OpenBSD, I just give it a, a gig of RAM. Of course, um, I'll go more in my the talk on, on Sunday, but um, the OpenBSD guest, each guest runs boot B, uh, which is how our um, rally table for all sites, so all sites know about each other. I think it's about 250 meg operation that, that each OpenBSD guest has, but that includes the full routing table. And there's no summaries in our routing tables, so um, it has to stuff a lot of stuff in there. Um, we bought 11 units. Uh, it saw us deploy FreeBSD 11.1, and at the time, halfway through the deployment of the units, uh, saw us go to 11.2. Um, we didn't see any measurable differences between 11.1 and 11.2. It's just 11.1 was going to go out of support three months after 2 came out, so we decided to just roll to it. Um, we moved from um, chives 
to the VMB Hive. VMB Hive made everything simplistic. The data sets were simplistic, the configuration was simplistic, and booting, powering up, shutting down, maintaining VMs was older simplicity than what we're like to have. There's been some different work done on our hoping uh, 1.3 will come out shortly because it actually fixes gradually a few security issues. So I wrote a policy article on um, how to use uh, VMB Hive to boot up the VM3 to do an install uh, because you have to boot the installs all of the test files and the ISO doesn't have the shims for the VM by booting. So I had to do a bit of a puzzle hack on VMB Hive to perform things, but um, it achieved what we needed to to do it and install up. And so basically I had a second disk that goes, I can't boot the first disk, boot the second disk and away it goes. So um, that's been fixed in, in 1.3 that, he, that um, the maintainer has sitting in his tree. So uh, it'll be good to um, get that into production. Um, it saw us then be able to deliver Windows Server 2016 and OpenBSD in complete UFI mode. So, hurrah. Console, same console, two different port numbers. Sweet. Um, and two different versions. So we had um, a version of that with two 240 gig SSDs uh, for remote sites. However, um, for some of our biggest sites, where we want to do some uh, Windows patching on local machines and that sort of stuff, I have a cache server. We built a, um, with spinning rust, uh, with two six terabyte um, drives that gave us the ability to then make big Windows VMs. So you know, you have your standard 50 gig hard disk um, for C drive, and then you have another Z ball for B drive, which would have another terabyte. Of WSUS. I don't know what it is. I'm not a Windows admin, but I leave that to the Windows admin guys. I just give them the tools that they need and away they go. Um, so, yeah, that gave us um, two products a thing guest and a volume storage guest. Um, so, yeah, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, FAQ. There's a few questions I've been asked over the time, and so they're the questions and they're the answers. So, even if there's support, Issues with ESXi, why did we choose ESXi? So, VMware ESXi caused random crashing on OpenBSD guests. Um, so, I'll sort of pause there. Um, what I mean by that is that our VMware seems to handle its memory management. So, it's, it, and OpenBSD is very concise and, and it's really good because it highlights the issues that you may have, especially when either. Uh, through your hardware or virtual uh, platforms. ESXi would show up these issues around the IP2, the IP comp, that's part of IP2. Um, you would all of a sudden get a debugger. You come in one morning, you, you're not going nuts, and it's like, oh, yeah, what's broke? Oh, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's why we chose to move away from ESXi. Um, the other part is we would also experience um, when we do a change on the uh, routing table, or if we brought a few sites online at the same time, or if our OHP happens to be in any for us, and then half our sites drop away overnight, it's not a pain the first time we, we allow for that. Um, but then all of the routes would reappear in some sort of agenda, and the SA of um, group B uh, would make the SXI all over for OpenBSD SSI. However, we did not experience, have not experienced that particular issue with Beehive. So, you know, big win there for Beehive. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and even Beehive's, you know, some of our, ish, our, our ones out there have had little or no maintenance, and those, and I mean that from the host OS, OpenBSD has been updated. <laughs> Um, if it's internet facing, however, the, uh, uh, the, get, the, the host hasn't been updated. The, 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 the Beehive has just stood the test of time. Uh, even 
in some of its older forms, like some of the new ones, new part, new patches that have come in 11.1, 11.2. Um, you know, uh, we haven't needed those specific things because it's been so stable in 11.0. Um, the next question was, uh, why was VMB Hive used? So, um, changing from Chives to VMB Hive, it basically, as I say, that out of the box, it's worked faultlessly. Like there's been a few additions that have come along that have fixed some of the things. Like I've gone to the point where I've just about to provide a patch and the work's been done. I haven't had to worry about it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's some work that's in 1.3 that uh, detects if it's a, if the header on the, ISO or the FS has the UEFI bootloader stuff and will appropriately put AHCI HD or CD depending on um, the type of file it is. Um, and are we planning to uplift the appliance to FreeBSD 12? No. Okay. Um, so FreeBSD 12, no LPS support. While there is LPS still labelled on the device, if you look at the support, um, in terms of FreeBSD on the FreeBSD website, um, FreeBSD 11 branch will exceed the support lifecycle of FreeBSD 12. So a little reassess of what FreeBSD 12 is, um, but at this present point in time, unless the scale gets pushed out um, that's currently listed, uh, there is no plans to go to FreeBSD 12. Um, in our testing, we discovered enough breakage to make us very nervous about going to FreeBSD 12 and if the support lifecycle is shortened and we have to wait for 12.1 because that's where a lot of the stuff has been fixed that we did dis discover it was broken, um, the effort and engineering required to move to 12 is just not worth it. I'd rather just skip that and go to 13. Um, so the conclusion. Uh, so basically, while it meets the business need and solved our problems, it exceeded our expectations. So the product itself has been you know, faultless. It's done exactly what we needed and, and achieved the scope that was given to us by management. Um, even though it's technically term, uh, uh, termed as a type two pipe advisor, um, we consider the, the device to be a type one pipe advisor purely because that's all the device does. And if you look under the hood of VMware website, VMware is it's a form of IT. So um, they class it as a type one, and we class the product as a type one. I mean, it's really just the semantics these days if you want to get down to it, like IBM did it better, and blah, blah, blah. Um, the other reason, the other thing that I'd like to conclude with is the rock solid reliability of the device. Um, in all the very hot, dusty broom closets that these things are set in, um, it's been faultless. It's the only time I've had to do a run is because, you know, something's bought the guest, and that's it. The actual um, host has been bulletproof. Um, Beehive is compatible with a wide, wide range of guests um, with where UEFI supports. So Dragonfly um, also works. I haven't tried UPSD. Uh, uh, so yeah, if you've got a UFI um, supported operating system, it's good to go. It's fast and flexible. Um, all the horizon. Uh, so there's some stuff that I'm sort of working with with a couple of devs at the moment with uh, NVMe support, uh, which could increase the performance of this and. Um, I have got a, a concept or an idea for a project um, to do a bigger scale, so using bigger hardware to, to do this, so to run alongside our main DSXi cluster. So it's a few things that I'm sort of working on there, um, but yeah, the NVMe presentation storage where you could then use the backing of RAM on a host uh, could see some um, really fast uh, database transactions. So uh, it's something we've got a few database bottlenecks uh, in the organisation where a 
I'd like to sort of start experimenting and thinking outside the square and seeing what we can deliver. Um, because, yeah, we do use virtualization a lot. Um, oh, there was one other thing, the patch that I was talking about um, with um, the UEFI bootloader. Um, so, the, it was around the expansion of when OpenBSD groups go to the bootloader, which is um, the kernel and the username and username resolution. Um, patch basically fixes that by constraining itself to the size that you actually interface to the like kernel you're trying to fix. So, um, now Clean works, that font works perfectly. Um, it stays in the constraint box, so if you say, you know, we don't want 800 by 600, it's running console to make sure it comes up in the application tree. But everything works perfectly, so the bootloader that wants to prep there into the, into the actual kernel of the patch properly, and it's all fast, it's not like the other kernel as well. So, um, I'd like to thank the developers there for uh, helping out and, and going down the path of working through a different um, uh, UEFI loader. Uh, those patches have been applied to the um, GitHub tree that we um, pull, ports and packages for the bit. So hopefully that gets mainstream uh, when the next uh, latest run is run and it's pulled. So yeah, that fixed that and that moves to Thanks. So I'd like to thank the following projects with VI, uh, the FreeBSD project. Thank you very much uh, to the project and the foundation for continuing the support of VI. And now that it's so ingrained in our organization, you know, I have a vested interest in, in making sure that uh, as we proceed with the development, that uh, uh, we keep focus on it and uh, keep, keep progressing got the foundations now, now it's just a matter of carrying it out. I'd like to thank Mike and Dexter. Thank you uh, for your encouragement back in 2014 um, in getting or starting to play around with this and uh, now it's turned into fruition and thank you for organising this event. Uh, Peter Green, uh, one of the lead developers that started with on uh, Beehive, uh, got behind the scenes um, in the early times when I've been trying to get this up and running. Uh, he's, he's been helpful in sort of like having an issue. He'd see the issue and go, oh, I can understand that. He'd then provide a patch or work on it or give me advice on, on um, where I needed to go to sort this out. Rodney Grimes, um, he's been a, uh, a, a good addition to the project and very level headed and, and comes from. An era where I worked in and understands, you know, some of the things that you know, us old folks tend to uh, you know, normal way at. And I also would like to thank everyone else, um, developers here, that work tirelessly on open source software. Of course, without you guys, we wouldn't have the tools that we've got now. And you do either as part of your day job, or you do it as interest, or you do it out of love of it. And um, you know, uh, I and a lot of other people um, really respect that and thank you. How can you help donate? So, um, continue V5 um, development. Um, please donate to the FreeBSD Foundation. And No, so we didn't. This this didn't have to come under the ASD requirements. So ASD is the Australian Signals Directorate, which is previously the Defence Signals Directorate, and that is the um, the security document that uh, all government organisations have to abide by. Um, now, the end user tablets that have been used by the NDIS are um, controlled and managed by the government. So, and they set up endpoints. So there's no uh, switch tunneling in the VPN, and they make all connections to all web tools to that VPN. So we have no control over that tablet, and so the network doesn't apply to the VPN because no tablet can go out from the VPN. And we 
they do are the jobs of art and their artists. Um, so it didn't, there was no requirement to have our, our uh, network or EPM uh, certified. Something I just took my eyes about it. So, as you touched on how you were handling that, the safety of the doctor and the safety of the other doctor. Yeah. Are the other ones just not trained? Not on it. I guess just, just in terms of just public perception. So, if you sell them on, I guess this is more speaking from a point of view. I guess you kind of addressed it at the end in terms of uh, you know, the big group of people who are saying, oh, you want me to do my TV like a third of it or, or better take care of students. Uh, I know just from my, without getting too much detail today, um, we've been dealing with a couple of health providers and, and I, they want to run with their server and I said, oh, great, run ZFS with YouTube because they have these horrible HP volume systems that do things like if that MPPL is on file, they'll just copy a file with a couple of kilobytes of changes. Oh, it might be a gig in size. I said, put that on ZFS PQ, but on on PHP, and it runs much faster than that can be done. And they see that phrase, and I guess because it doesn't have Amazon or it doesn't have you know, the guy that Blanche, and then yeah. you say, I don't want to touch it. Yeah. But does that? It sounds like that was a joint issue for you. Yeah, it? because um, we went down a conceptual stage, and um, we had to work in a budget constraint. So we looked for anything that's going to give us an advantage, because. Um, from a financial point of view, we have to make sure we spend our money correctly because we're transparent and we get audited by the government. And being a, uh, a not-for-profit organisation, uh, as you're well aware in Australia, under the new current law, we're looking at sort of the financial regulatory requirements. So, um, no, it didn't have. It wasn't hard to sell it because we already had a basically running environment for oh, I think around eighteen months before. Now. So, um, the BSD word was always there, and it just required to show how you can make a compliance out of this and you know, have confidence in it. And if you have confidence in being able to talk about a product and you're very knowledgeable in it, then you have the ability to sell it. And that was, that was key, was, was being able to you know, be confident in the product and sell the product. Um, and that's just how we sell it. So, we don't use DQ. Yeah, I'm a man of memory in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, in this day and age, um, uh, ZFS using LZ4 uh, compression, with its optimized station, uh, where it, because it's basically a bomb level tube in Zbox, um, if it can press it, it will, um, but if it goes for a while before it can't compress it, then it just leaves it uncompressed. Okay. And with um, 3BG 11.1 introducing, um, Press R. Oh, it meant that you know that two giga because um, uh, we limit our R to two giga, giga room um, meant that uh, the you know that might keep three gig of, of R in there. So Windows loves that, yeah. and um, you know, it, it then operates more on memory, even though it's SSD back. So it's still fast there. Um, you know, more 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 performance than memory, especially when it comes to like having CPU. Yeah. Exactly. Question from the chat room. Yes. So Poops asks, what were the major issues faced with 12.0 specifically in use case? And have they been reported in the past? Uh, yes, they have been reported. And yes, they've been sorted and stable. So um, one of them was uh, IPv6. Um, IPv6 would just, yep. <laughs> just disappear and you all of a sudden I'd say, why is, why is my host gone there? And uh, yeah, IP, IPv6 was busted. Um, another one was the um, Intel EAM driver was busted as well. Um, from a point of view where even though it only affects um, laptops where I was on my laptop where I was actually did demonstrations and that sort of stuff, spending the EAM to suspend it to resume it. It would, it would, the laptop would come back to life, but then you'd lose network connectivity. And 
nothing you can do to actually bring your network back to life. It's just going to be that makes it more of a higher bridge. Have I got any other questions? Thank you all.